It is the autumn of 1775. Americans are in the throes of revolution, at war with themselves. The day before, these men were Jacob Bowman's friends and neighbors. Now, they are a mob of enemies. My grandfather was surprised at night by a party of rebels and with his eldest son was taken prisoner. His house was pillaged. There my grandmother was with six children without any provisions in the house. At the commencement of winter. The Bowman family is guilty of no crime but loyalty to England. Loyalty to the wrong side. It will cost Jacob and his eldest son four years of their lives. All over the 13 colonies, others like the Bowmans will suffer, their homes and fields burned, driven from their land, beaten, humiliated. In the next 40 years, the question of loyalties will twice turn North America into a battleground and trigger the greatest mass migration in its history. It will first divide, then uproot the Indian nations, making them refugees in their own land. And it will change the face of the continent, creating one country and planting the seeds of another. A year before the revolution, Quebec City is at peace. In the dozen years since the conquest, French and English have reached an accommodation of sorts. Quebec has become part of the British Empire without losing its language, its French laws, or its Catholic religion. In return, the seigneurs and the church leaders, the elite of Quebec society, have pledged their loyalty to Britain. Governor Guy Carleton feels confident and secure. I have had the satisfaction of finding His Majesty's Canadian subjects impressed with the strongest sense of the King's great goodness toward them. The Canadians have testified to me the strongest marks of joy and gratitude to the king and his government. I am convinced their fidelity and zeal might be depended on. But in the world outside the governor's mansion, rebellion is brewing. On the night of the governor's ball, a Montreal merchant begins spreading a message from the American rebels. Thomas Walker has always hated British military rule. Now he has become a militant Republican. 
Under the guise of selling wheat in the rural districts, he begins selling sedition instead. Walker circulates a proclamation from the American rebels inviting Quebec to join the revolution. It is both an appeal and a threat. Seize the opportunity. Take a noble chance for emerging from a humiliating subjection under governors and military tyrants into the firm rank and condition of free English citizens. You are a small people compared to those who invite you into a fellowship. A moment's reflection should convince you which will be most for your interest and happiness. To of all the rest of North America, your unalterable friends or your inveterate enemies. Walker begins recruiting Canadians to join the rebel cause. A young carpenter from Sainte-Famille who drums up volunteers. A wealthy merchant from La Pocatière who guarantees clothing and muskets to new recruits. In the words of one seigneur, they are preaching rebellion everywhere and raising holy hell. The loudest voice opposing the rebellion is the church. Its leaders know the Americans will never recognize the Catholic religion as the British have done. The bishop decrees that anyone who takes up arms against the king will be denied the sacraments and the right to Christian burial. But on a Sunday morning in trois Riviere, young notary Jean-Baptiste Badeau wonders if his fellow parishioners are listening. We received the blessing of the Holy Sacrament, and we began praying fervently during Mass and at the offering. There were very good Christians all around us, but how many others were there as well? As they were leaving church, I heard with my own ears several people saying they came to pray for an American victory. This is how far our faith has fallen. No wonder God has thrown a dark cloud over our miserable province. The cloud bursts at Lexington, Massachusetts in April 1775. The shot heard round the world plunges Britain and her 13 colonies into war. And Canadians are rapidly drawn into America's revolution. The rebel commander, George Washington, is determined to seize Quebec before Britain can use it as a springboard to invade the 13 colonies. I need not mention the great importance of this place and the consequent possession of all Canada. If it is ours, success, I think, will most certainly crown our struggles. If it is theirs, the contest, at least, will be doubtful, hazardous, and bloody. Washington's network of spies in Quebec reports that Canadians have uncertain loyalties. They might not join the revolution, but they will not resist it either. In Montreal, the widow Therese Babi writes to her family in Quebec City. My dear brother, you cannot imagine the panic that has overtaken us all. Many people have sent their documents and valuables to the country, and many people are getting ready to leave altogether. I've decided to risk staying with my two daughters. I'm saddened by all this, but then again, it makes me laugh to see how some cowards can no longer hide their fear. Most Canadians want no part of a war they regard as a family feud between two brands of Englishmen. 
when the governor calls up the militia, most refuse to take up arms. Carlton now faces a bitter reality. He must defend the province with only a small force of British redcoats. Not 600 rank and file fit for duty upon the whole extent of this great river. Not an armed vessel, no place of strength, the ancient provincial force enervated and broke to pieces. All subordination overset, and the minds of the people poisoned with the same hypocrisy and lies practiced with such success in other provinces, which their emissaries and friends here have spread abroad with great art and diligence. With his province divided and his army outnumbered, Carleton knows he is vulnerable. And so do the American rebels. In the summer of 1775, General Washington sends two armies to invade Quebec. One force of a thousand men will sail up Lake Champlain and the Richelieu River to strike at Montreal. It is led by Richard Montgomery, once a captain in the British Army, now the youngest major general in the American Army. But the second attack is to be the real surprise. Coming up through the wilds of Maine and then up the Chaudière to assault Quebec. This backdoor route is so treacherous that even the Indian raiding parties spurn it. It is led by a Connecticut hothead who will be one of the revolution's greatest heroes, then its most despised traitor. I am now on my march to Quebec to restore liberty to our brethren of Canada. Benedict Arnold has been everything, a sea captain, a horse trader, a smuggler. Now he wants to try his hand at conquest. Arnold has often done business in Quebec, where one of his partners was the spy Thomas Walker. Walker now assures him that Quebec is ripe for the taking. The bulk of the people, both English and Canadians, wish well to your cause. Few in this colony dare vent their griefs but groan in silence and dream of confiscations and imprisonments, offering up their prayers to the throne of grace to prosper your righteous cause, which alone can free us from those fears and apprehensions that rob us of our peace. Arnold is still six weeks away, but Montgomery's army has already begun the invasion. Thanks to Walker, several hundred Canadians have joined their ranks, and Quebec is falling to the invader piece by piece. By mid-September, they are on the doorstep to Montreal. Now all that stands between the city and the enemy is the British fort at Saint-Jean. The Americans surround it, cut its supply lines, and bring up the siege guns. Inside the fort are a few hundred British regulars and a handful of Canadian militia. There are also 80 women and children. For the first few weeks, they carefully count every musket cartridge and ration every scrap of food, and the siege is bearable. For seven grim weeks, they hold out. But on the last night, the American guns pound the fort for eight long hours. By morning, British Lieutenant John Andre knows it is the end. The situation of the sick and wounded was a very cruel one. They were neither out of reach of danger nor sheltered from the inclemency of the weather. 
There was now nothing left but to frame the best articles we could for the garrison. A surrender with honor. On November 3rd, the battered garrison at Fort Saint-Jean gives in. Much of the British army is now in captivity. Montreal is defenseless. You can't imagine we're in the worst possible situation. The governor has just told the Canadiens they are free to leave or to stay. I think we are doomed. And we are waiting to be taken. I'm sure this is the last letter I can send you. A few days later, Montgomery's Americans take Montreal without a fight. Some welcome them as liberators, declaring, our hearts have always desired the union offered to us by our brothers of the colonies. Governor Carleton escapes Montreal at the last minute and flees to Quebec City. En route, he is stunned by the news he must defend it against not one, but two invading armies. Fortunately for Carleton, Benedict Arnold's army is a wreck. The map George Washington gave him is 15 years old and underestimates the distance to Quebec by 200 miles. Most of Arnold's boats have been smashed to pieces, the food and supplies swept away in the freezing water. The survivors are reduced to eating their candles and shaving soap, even the leather of their shoes. Many of the men began to fall behind, and those in any condition to march were scarcely able to support themselves, so that it was impossible to bring them along. If we tarried with them, we must all have perished. Private George Morrison. It is a skeleton army that finally emerges at Point Levis to stare across at the ramparts of Quebec. Of the 1,200 men who started out, less than 700 remain. But Arnold is still eager for battle. On the morning of November the 15th, he marches his men onto the plains outside the city walls and taunts the garrison to come out and fight. I am ordered by His Excellency, General Washington, to take possession of the town of Quebec. I do therefore, in the name of the United Colonies, demand immediate surrender of the town and fortifications. Inside the fortress, Governor Carleton makes a show of burning the ultimatum without reading it. But he knows that Montgomery's army is approaching from Montreal to join the siege, and privately, he doesn't hold out much hope. Could the people of the town be depended upon? I should flatter myself we might hold out. But we have so many enemies within a foolish people, dupes to those traitors, with the natural fears of men unused to war. I think our fate extremely doubtful. To say nothing worse, While Quebec City digs in for the fourth siege in its history, Governor Carleton resorts to desperate measures. I do hereby order all who have refused to enroll their names in the militia lists and to take up arms to quit the town in four days, together with their wives and children, under pain of being treated as rebels or spies. Outside, camped on the plains of Abraham, Montgomery and Arnold have their own problems. 
Nearly half of the American army is due to be released because their enlistments expire on New Year's Day. Time is running out. The Americans know it, and so does the garrison inside Quebec. In the night, a deserter from the rebels came in at the palace gate. It was the deserter's opinion that we'd be attacked on the first snowy or stormy night. For a week, the skies are clear. But on New Year's Eve, the weather turns. And finally, the Americans attack. The plan is to take Lower Town first, then rush the fortress. At two o'clock in the morning, Montgomery attacks on one flank, leading a force of about 300. All that stands in his way is a band of 30 Canadian militiamen and a few British seamen. They're outnumbered 10 to 1, but they have one advantage. In the driving snowstorm, Montgomery never sees them. The Canadians fire a single devastating volley. Montgomery and most of his officers are cut down. The rest of the Americans flee back to camp. Benedict Arnold knows none of this. His force of 700, attacking from the other side of Lower Town, runs a gauntlet of fire below the city walls. Arnold himself is stopped by a musket ball in the leg, but his men fight their way to the rendezvous in Lower Town where Montgomery is supposed to join them. They don't know he's already dead, and no one is coming. But Governor Carleton knows. He sends a force of Canadian militia to circle around behind and cut off their retreat. Arnold's men wait, and in waiting, they lose the battle. The enemy having the advantage of the ground in front, a vast superiority of numbers and dry and better arms gave them an irresistible power in so narrow a space. It was apparent to all of us that we must surrender. It was done. Four hundred Americans surrender. Another eighty are dead. In snow now so deep, many of the bodies will not be found until spring. Now, even those Canadians who secretly prayed for an American victory turn against them. The fortress has held. As soon as the ice breaks on the St. Lawrence, British ships arrive with reinforcements, and the American invasion of Quebec, begun almost a year earlier, collapses in failure. The governor's annual ball that year celebrates a great victory. But before the revolution is over, Canada will again be invaded by Americans. This time, though, it will not be her armies, but her refugees. Farewell, unhappy land for which my heart bleeds in pity. Little does it signify to you who are the conquered or who the victorious. You are devoted to ruin, whoever succeeds. Janet Shaw. By the summer of 1776, the revolution has become a bloody struggle between the United States and Britain. In New York City, 
a mob celebrates the Declaration of Independence by toppling a statue of King George III and melting it down for musket balls. But the revolution has left Americans deeply divided. On one side, the rebels who support independence. On the other, the British loyalists. The rebels declare them enemies of American liberty. Thousands of families are driven out, paying the price of their loyalty with exile. Before it is over, the revolution will make refugees of 100,000 loyalists, and nearly half of them will find refuge in the land that will become Canada. Rich, poor, black, white, Indian. Their flight is one of the great mass migrations in North American history. Anna Ingraham is 11 years old when her family is forced from their farm in Albany County, New York. She saw her grandfather taken by the rebels to a prison ship and her father flee to join the British Army. We had a comfortable farm, plenty of cows and sheep. But when the war began and father joined the Redcoats, the rebels took it all away. My father was in the Army seven years. Mother was four years without hearing from him whether he was alive or dead. Anyone would be hanged right up if they were caught bringing letters. Oh, they were terrible times. For Hannah, Canada is still a year and a voyage of nearly a thousand miles away. Others have already fled there with a price on their heads. These loyalists will form the guerrilla armies that are Britain's best weapon against the revolution. The Royal Yorkers, Jessup's Loyal Americans, and the most famous of them all, Butler's Rangers. Launching raids from bases in Canada, they are, said one American soldier, harder to find than a pack of wolves in the woods. The revolution has become a bloody civil war. Loyalty to Britain has been declared a crime. Punishable by the whipping post and the noose. Jacob Bowman and his son will barely survive the revolution, rotting in a Connecticut prison. They were there fastened together by a band of iron around their arms and a chain around their ankles. In that condition, they remained three years and a half until the flesh was worn away and the bones laid bare four inches. Young Peter Bowman has never forgotten that night his home was looted and his father and older brother were taken by the rebels. When he passes his 13th birthday, he is old enough to fight back. In 1778, Peter Bowman joins Butler's Rangers. That summer, they begin returning to their homelands in New York State. Savagery will be met with savagery.
Whole communities go up in smoke as rebel and loyalist families make war on each other. And now, the brutality of the revolution will engulf another nation. Winter of 1775 has begun turning the river to ice when the ship Adamant clears the St. Lawrence and sets sail for England. On board is a passenger carrying a bold proposition for King George. Joseph Brandt is a chief of the Mohawk tribe, but on this mission he will be the emissary for the Six Nations Confederacy, the Seneca, Cayuga, Onondaga, Oneida, Mohawk, and Tuscarora. The onslaught of white settlers has already begun to squeeze the tribes from their lands in northern New York. Now they fear an independent United States will swallow up what remains. This is what drove Joseph Brandt to sail across an ocean to appeal to the King of England. The Mohawks have been treated very badly in that country. Indeed, it is very hard when we have let them have so much of our land for so little value. They should want to cheat us of the small spots we have left for our women and children to live on. We are tired out in making complaints and getting no redress. as a sensation in London society. His Mohawk name is Tyondanega, he who places two bets. Educated and able to read and write English, Brandt is indeed a man of two worlds. Journalists clamor for interviews. He tells them what he chiefly admires in London are the ladies and the horses. But his real business here is to make a deal. And by the time he sits for the artist George Romney, he has it. Britain agrees to safeguard Indian lands in America, and in return, Brandt will raise the tomahawk against the king's enemies. But Brandt returns home to find his people divided. The Six Nations have been split by the white man's war. Four of the tribes agree to fight for the British. But the Oneidas and the Tuscaroras choose the rebel side. Throughout the revolution, Six Nations warriors fight in every major battle in the north. Brant's volunteers are so effective, they become the most hated men in the United States. Stories spread of atrocities real and imagined. The rebels respond with a ruthless new tactic. The immediate objects are the total devastation of their settlements and the capture of as many prisoners of every age and sex as possible. Parties should be dispatched to lay waste all the settlements around with instructions to do it in the most effectual manner, that the country not be merely overrun, but destroyed. George Washington. About sunrise, the general gave orders for the town to be illuminated, and accordingly we had a glorious bonfire of upwards of 30 buildings at once. A melancholy, and desperate spectacle to the Indians, many of whom must have beheld it from a neighboring hill.
In just two months, Washington's orders do more damage to the Six Nations than five years of war have done. The Indians are driven out, their villages burned, fields and orchards laid waste, their burial grounds defiled. In September 1779, General John Sullivan, future governor of New Hampshire, reports on his success. Every creek and river has been traced and the whole country explored in search of Indian settlements. And I am well persuaded that there is not a single town left in the country of the Six Nations. Joseph Brandt watches as his people become refugees on their own land. We the Indians wish to have the blow returned on the enemy as early as possible. But I'm afraid it will again be but a trifling affair. We think the rebels will ruin us at last if we go on as we do, one year after another doing nothing. We are in between two hells. Let us have an expedition early in the spring. Let us not hang our heads between our knees. Brant's warriors fight on for two more years, but the tide has turned. The Six Nations will be forced to start again in a new land. In the fall of 1781 at Yorkton, Virginia, the British suffer their final defeat of the war. General Charles Cornwallis is forced to surrender an army of more than 7,000 men. The war will drag on for another two years, but the Loyalists know it is over. And for many, defeat holds a terrifying prospect. The revolution has triggered the first mass escape in the history of American slavery. To every Negro who shall desert the rebel standard, full security to follow within the British lines. That British promise has inspired the flight to freedom of tens of thousands of black slaves. They pour into New York City, where they hope the British can still protect them. But even here, stories spread that they are being hunted down. This dreadful rumor filled us with inexpressible anguish and terror. Especially when we saw old masses coming from Virginia, North Carolina, and other parts and seizing upon their slaves in the streets of New York, or even dragging them out of their beds. Boston King was born a slave in South Carolina. The war has set him on a journey that will take him halfway around the world. By 1783, New York City is teeming with Loyalist refugees and the remains of the British Army, perhaps 70,000 souls in all. For many, it is the last stop before exile. Some, like Connecticut Loyalist Stephen Jarvis, tried to go home but found only hostility. An old man, an Irishman, came to see me to warn me to be on my guard as the militia were coming to mob me. I saw many who I knew, went up to them and offered my hand. One of them, who seemed to be their leader, addressed me in these words. Jarvis, you must leave this town immediately. Now we won't hurt you. 
But if you are seen within 30 miles of this place by sundown, you must abide by the consequences. Like Boston King, Jarvis flees to New York City to be evacuated. That summer of 1783, the harbor is full of British ships, nearly 200 of them. And every day, more and more loyalists are leaving. From the south, thousands have already fled to Jamaica, the Bahamas, and the West Indies. Some sail home to Britain, but the majority of loyalists, 35,000, choose to go north to the rocky Atlantic coast of Nova Scotia. Hannah Ingraham, now reunited with her father, is among the last to leave. Father said we were to go to Nova Scotia, that a ship was ready to take us there. This was September. The transport that was to bring us to St. John was the last transport of the season and had on board all those who could not come sooner. The Loyalists will profoundly change the land that gives them refuge, building new communities out of the wilderness and laying the foundations of a separate nation. It is, I think, the roughest land I ever saw. But this is to be our city, they say. Sarah Frost. I climb to the top of Chipman's Hill and watch the sails disappear. Although I had not shed a tear throughout all the war, I sat down on the damp moss with my baby in my lap and cried. Sarah Tilly. The flood of refugee loyalists that lands on the shores of Nova Scotia nearly triples the population overnight. The Caldwells and the Dodds, the McKays, the Moody's, the Thompsons. Surveyors frantically lay out town sites and homesteads. But as fleet after fleet brings new arrivals, John Parr, the colony's governor, is overwhelmed a considerable number of refugee families, destitute of almost everything, must be provided for, chiefly women and children, as I have not yet been able to find any sort of place for them, and the cold setting in severe. 20,000 refugees flood into the coastal towns of Yarmouth, Annapolis Royal, Antigonish. Whole communities spring up where nothing existed before. Many spend their first winter in tents or crowded into army barracks, surviving on rations doled out from street kitchens. I hired a hovel for $40 a year, and in this wretched abode, we remained for several weeks. I purchased a town lot, commenced building, and opened a small store of goods. In October, we got into our new dwellings as happy as princes. But my poor wife suffered greatly from the dampness of the walls. And on the 9th of January, 1785, was delivered of a dead son. Stephen Jarvis joins the wave of new settlers that spread up the St. John River, creating the towns of St. John, Queenston, Gagetown and Fredericton. It is here that Hannah Ingraham's family settles. They spent their first winter in tents, but by spring, Hannah's father has built their first rough home. There was no floor laid, no windows, no door, but we had a roof at least. A good fire was blazing, and Mother boiled a kettle of water. We all sat at our breakfast that morning, and Mother said, Thank God we are no longer in danger of having shots fired through our house. This is the sweetest meal I ever tasted. Hannah Ingraham never married and never left Fredericton. 
she lived to be 97, long enough to see the beginning of the age of photography. The exodus of loyalists continues through the summer and fall of 1783. At the port of Roseway, there are sometimes upwards of 30 ships unloading their human cargo. A few miles away, on a rocky, desolate stretch of shoreline, the largest free black settlement on the continent has begun. But most of the black loyalists in Birchtown never get the land or the provisions the British promised. When the blacks take menial jobs in nearby Shelburne, white workers start riots and drive them out. They have escaped one kind of slavery only to face another. Many of my black brethren were obliged to sell themselves to the merchants. Some for two or three years, others for five or six years. Several fell down dead in the streets through hunger. Some killed and ate their dogs and cats. Poverty and distress prevailed on every side so that, to my great grief, I was compelled to leave Birchtown. In January 1792, Boston King and 1,200 other black loyalists board a fleet of ships hired by the Sierra Leone Company. They leave to join a new colony of free blacks in West Africa, though they continue to call themselves Nova Scotians. But despite the hardships, most of the black loyalists chose to stay and put down roots. Former slaves became landowners and builders. It was another 40 years before slavery was formally abolished in British North America. By then, a generation of black loyalist descendants had grown up in Nova Scotia as free men and women. says that his people would rather go to Japan than go back among the Americans, where they could never live in peace. Colonel Alan McLean. Ontario is still a wilderness called the Upper Country when the men of Butler's Rangers face a new reality. The Niagara Peninsula was their base of operations during the Revolution. Now it will be home. Private Peter Bowman has been at war since he turned 13. Now at age 20, the warrior will become a farmer. My father settled on his land near the falls of Niagara. The government found seed to plant and sow the first year. Men, women and children all went to work clearing the land. It is the price of backing the revolution's losing side. The Bowmans have left behind a homestead. The Iroquois have lost lands their people held for centuries. When we heard peace was made between His Majesty and the Americans, we were struck with astonishment at learning we were forgot in the treaty. We could not believe it possible that such firm friends and allies could be so neglected by a nation remarkable for its honor and glory, for whom we had served with so much zeal and fidelity. Britain tries to carve out lands for the Iroquois in the peace treaty, 
but the Americans refuse. In the fall of 1784, Brandt leads 1,800 of his people to a new homeland on the banks of the Grand River. What they lost in the land of their ancestors, they will rebuild in the land of their future. At the other end of Lake Ontario, Thousands of Loyalists are taking up their land along the St. Lawrence River. Settlements are springing up between Cornwall and Kingston. I baptize you in the name of the Father. By 1791, the upper country has the fastest growing population on the continent, and the Loyalists begin agitating to be recognized as a colony separate from Quebec, a colony where they can have a role in governing themselves. The congregation of Christ's flock. Loyalist settlers have already convinced Britain to divide Nova Scotia, creating the new colony of New Brunswick with its own elected assembly. In London, Colonial Secretary William Grenville now fears if he does not also divide Quebec, the French Canadians and the British Loyalists will never live in peace. If these two bodies and classes of men differing in their prejudices and perhaps in their interests were to be consolidated into one legislative body, dissensions and animosities might probably prevail. It should seem, therefore, that the natural remedy for this would be the separation of the province into two districts. In June 1791, Quebec is divided into the colonies of Upper and Lower Canada, each with its own governor and elected assembly. In the next few years, under the stewardship of John Graves Simcoe, Upper Canada will change dramatically. He offers free land, attracting a new brand of settler, American pioneers from New York and Pennsylvania, New Jersey and Connecticut. Lady Elizabeth Simcoe is astounded at their numbers. A great many settlers come daily from the United States, some even from the Carolinas, about 2,000 miles away. Five or 600 miles is no more considered by an American than moving to the next parish is by an Englishman. Soon, the American settlers outnumber the Loyalists in Upper Canada by four to one, and these new arrivals have no particular allegiance to the British Crown. At the time, that didn't seem to matter, but within 15 years, Canada will be in peril, and the question of loyalty will haunt those who must defend it. On the 21st of January, 1793, Louis XVI, King of France, climbed a scaffold in Paris. The Catholic priest, Father de Fermont, steadied his arm. It was all over in a few moments. The youngest of the executioners took hold of the head and brandished it around the people gathered at the scaffold. Soon a few cries of Vive la République would be heard. Then the shouts multiplied, and this chant became the cry of thousands. The killing of a king helped propel the second great revolution of the century, and it launched a war in Europe that would spill across the ocean to North America. Canada would begin the new century with a fight for survival, a war that would decide the future of two nations, and extinguish the dreams of a third. It is more than a month before news of the king's execution reaches Quebec City in Lower Canada. 
Whatever the Canadiens may have thought about the French Revolution before, now it turns to revulsion. Philippe Aubert de Gaspé never forgot the day the news arrived. Suddenly my father leaped from his chair, his eyes aflame. He cried, infamous beast, they have guillotined their king. The chaos and brutality of the revolution drive a wedge between France and her former colony, but British leaders cannot see it. When Sir James Craig, the new governor, arrives in 1806, all he can see is a province of 300,000 people where the French language, the Seigneur, and the Catholic Church still rule. They are in their hearts French yet. And whatever attachment they may affect to feel to the government, yet there would not be 50 dissenting voices to a proposition for their re-annexation to France. The general opinion among the English part of the inhabitants is that they would even join an American force if that force were commanded by a French officer. Britain has now been at war with France almost continuously for 13 years, and Quebec City is afire with rumors. The French fleet is poised to invade, the Canadiens ready to rise up in revolt, backed by Napoleon's troops. The Quebec Mercury, the voice of the English minority, fans the flames. This province is already too much of a French province for an English colony. To unfrenchify it as much as possible, if I may be allowed the phrase, should be a primary objective. After 47 years of possession of Quebec, it is time the province should be English. But Lower Canada is no threat to Britain. The Canadiens have embraced the British parliamentary system and the concept of free elections. The most powerful man in the assembly is Pierre Bédard, a baker's son with a genius for politics. In what essential point are Canadian subjects different from English subjects? Cannot a Canadian be, and is he not in reality, English in his love of English liberty, in his attachment to the English government, and his aversion for French principles? Does loyalty consist in identity of language? Badar has long been a thorn in the governor's side. But their feud escalates when Badar and his supporters buy a printing press. On the editorial pages of the newspaper Le Canadien, Badar asserts the right of the elected assembly to make policy, attacking the governor's appointed officials. The son of a baker, who possesses the best abilities of the lot, is by far the most dangerous of the set. Those who know him best do not scruple to give it as their opinion that there are no lengths to which he is not capable of going. Dissent has also found a voice in the neighboring province of Upper Canada. In that assembly, it is an Irishman who leads the opposition to the governor. And like Badar, he too publishes a newspaper. On the pages of the Upper Canadian Guardian, Joseph Wilcox attacks the administration so viciously he will twice be charged with libel. Methinks I am of much more consequence than I thought myself to be. I am flattered at being ranked among the enemies of the king's servants in this colony. I glory in the distinction. Is it truth? and a constant adherence to the interest of the country that has excited so much alarm among this band of sycophantic office hunters, pensioners, and pimps. The British governors cannot tolerate dissent, for Britain now fears it is heading towards a second war with the Americans. Opposition in the Canadas will not be forgiven.
In Upper Canada, Joseph Wilcox is sent to jail for criminal libel. He will turn to treason before the war is over. In Quebec City, Pierre Bedard publishes a statement assuring the governor that he can count on the loyalty of the Canadiens. What would be the consequences if Canada were invaded by the United States? The Americans, on invading Canada, would occupy most Canadian properties and reduce the Canadiens to the sad condition of slaves. As for myself, I would rather see the country overrun by a horde of vandals. But Governor Craig is unmoved. He orders Bedar arrested for treasonable practices. His political career is finished. But when war comes, Bedar is proven right about the loyalty of his people. The Canadiens are a conquered people, he writes, but they will show you the path of honor. By 1811, Britain's tactics in her war with France have enraged the United States. British warships are seizing American ships bound for Europe and pressing American seamen into the Royal Navy. In Washington, a political faction called the War Hawks, led by Congressman Henry Clay, is demanding retaliation. We are invited to submit to debasement, dishonor and disgrace, to bow the neck to royal insolence. What are we to gain by war has been asked. In reply, I would ask, what are we not to lose by peace? Britain is too distant to attack directly, but her North American colonies are vulnerable. Thomas Jefferson boasts that taking them will be a mere matter of marching. In Upper Canada, British Major General Isaac Brock prepares for war. Every American newspaper teams with violent and hostile resolutions against England. And associations are forming in every town for the ostensible purpose of attacking these provinces. I consider the time arrived when every loyal subject should come forward and show his zeal for his majesty's service. If the Americans attack, Brock will have the nearly impossible task of defending Upper Canada. It is vulnerable everywhere, but especially at Niagara and along the Detroit frontier. Fortunately for Brock, the Americans have handed him an unexpected ally. The Shawnee chief, Tecumseh, has no love for the British, but he despises the Americans. On the American frontier, the wave of white settlers pushing west has taken millions of acres of Indian land. Tecumseh has seen both his father and his brother killed by American settlers. Now he sees an opportunity to make a stand. Where today are the powerful tribes of our people? They have vanished before the greed and oppression of the white men as snow before the summer sun. And shall we let ourselves be destroyed in our turn without making an effort worthy of our race? Shall we, without a struggle, give up our homes, our lands, the graves of our dead, and everything that we hold dear and sacred? I know you will join with me in saying never. Never. Tecumseh urges the tribes to join the British, and his support now dramatically changes the odds. Without him, the prospects for Upper Canada seemed bleak. There are just 1,600 British troops here, and many of the civilians are recent American settlers. Isaac Brock knows he cannot depend on their loyalty. My situation 
is most critical. Not from anything the enemy can do, but from the disposition of the people. The population, believe me, is essentially bad. A full belief possesses them all that this province must inevitably succumb. Most of the people have lost all confidence. I, however, speak loud and look big. On the 18th of June, 1812, President James Madison signs the declaration of war against Britain. It begins as a gentleman's war. The news takes a week to reach Isaac Brock. On the night it arrives, the officers of his regiment at Fort George are entertaining a group of American officers from across the border. They insist on finishing the meal as though nothing has changed. Tomorrow, they will be doing their best to kill each other. The immediate threat to Upper Canada in August 1812 is at Fort Detroit. An American army of 2,500 men is poised to invade the province. Removing that threat is Isaac Brock's first objective. Setting out with just 300 men, Brock takes the offensive. It is a bold gamble, but his sheer audacity has an electrifying effect on the Indian tribes. Tecumseh is already waiting at Detroit with his own army of 600 warriors. A Canadian militiaman watches their ritual preparations for war. It was an extraordinary spectacle. A European witnessing this for the first time would have thought he was standing at the entrance to hell with the gates thrown open to let the damned out for an hour's recreation on earth. has also recruited 400 Upper Canadian militia. He disguises them in the red coats of the regular army to bluff the Americans into thinking they're all professional soldiers. At dawn on August the 16th, Brock's mismatched little army marches on the fort of Detroit. They are outnumbered two to one, but they have one big advantage. The Americans are terrified of the Indians. Tecumseh knows this and openly parades his warriors in full view of the fort. It's all a bluff, but Brock backs it up with a note to the American general. Sir. It is far from my inclination to join in a war of extermination. But you must be aware that the numerous body of Indians who have attached themselves to my troops will be beyond my control the moment the contest commences. In other words, expect a massacre. It is what the American general, William Hull, fears most. While the threat is sinking in, Brock orders his heavy guns to open fire. Lydia Bacon has just arrived in Detroit to join her husband, an American officer. Not for the last time in this war, civilians are caught between the clash of armies. Never shall I forget my sensation as the cannon began to roar with tenfold fury. I felt as if my nerves would burst and my eyes raised upward to catch a glimpse of the bombshells that were flying in all directions. For more than two hours, the fort is pounded by artillery fire. 
Brock waits, and the American commander loses his nerve. Standing in the British lines, Private Shadrach Byfield waits for the order to attack that never comes. After a while, an officer came from the fort with a flag of truce. I was on the advance with General Brock at the time, and from what we could hear, the officer wanted three day secession, to which our general replied that if they did not yield in three hours, he would blow up every one of them. Hull surrenders without a fight. An American observer writes to President Madison that the whole fiasco is the most weak, cowardly, and imbecile he's ever seen. Even Lydia Bacon feels disgraced. The American colors were taken from the staff and replaced by the English colors, and a royal salute fired from the very cannon taken from them in the Revolutionary War. Lydia and her husband are allowed to return home on the condition he not fight again. Their war is finished. Detroit is a stunning victory for Brock and Tecumseh, one without a single casualty, 2,200 prisoners, and enough captured muskets and cannon to equip an army. Best of all, the news has raised hopes in Upper Canada. The Americans can be beaten. But Brock knows Detroit is a stolen victory, and there is another, far greater contest looming. You will hear of some decisive action in the course of a fortnight. Or in all probability, we shall return to a state of tranquility. I say decisive because should I be victorious, I do not imagine the gentry from the other side will be anxious to return to the charge. And if I should be beaten, the province is inevitably gone. Downstream from the falls, the Niagara River is so narrow, a musket ball can be fired across it. Here, in the fall of 1812, a second American army prepares to avenge the humiliation of Detroit. On the heights of Queenston, the British watch and wait. In the early hours of October 13th, the garrison at Fort George is roused from bed by the thunder of heavy guns. Brock does not wait for his aides, but gallops off alone into the night toward the sound of fighting. He's not sure if this is a feint or the real thing. Seven miles away, the two sides are hurling cannon fire and musket balls across the Niagara River. One young soldier wrote, the mountains seem to shake beneath the stride of death. On the dark water below, 1,200 American troops are flooding across the river. Brock has his answer. It's a full-scale invasion. At first, the British guns pin down the Americans on the beach below Queenston Heights. Then by chance, they find a fisherman's path up the steep bank. In a surprise attack, they seize the British cannon. As 
General Brock arrives, the battle is fast turning in favor of the Americans. At daybreak, he decides on a desperate counterattack. It fails. Now the fate of Upper Canada rests in the hands of a band of 80 Mohawk warriors. They are led by the adopted son of Joseph Brandt, a man named John Norton, who is half Cherokee and half Scot. Comrades and brothers, remember the fame of ancient warriors whose breasts were never daunted by odds of number. We have found what we came for. There they are. It only remains to fight. Outnumbered 15 to 1, Norton's warriors strike and run repeatedly. The Americans stagger and cannot consolidate their position. It is a critical failure. At 2 o'clock, 10 hours after the attack began, British and Canadian reinforcements pour into Queenston. Now a thousand strong with Norton's warriors on the flank, they break cover and advance. The whole line opened to fire on us. We rushed forward. From the side of a hill where they lay, they fired again. We came in upon them swiftly. They left their cannon and they ran. The American commander, Winfield Scott, surrenders, delivering 925 prisoners. Barely four months into the war, two American armies have fallen. But the battle has been costly. A dozen warriors and two Mohawk chiefs were killed. The British and Canadians have lost nearly 100 men. But the Americans suffer far worse. Estimates of their casualties range as high as 500. For the young Canadian militiaman, John Beverly Robinson, the victory is bittersweet. Thus ended the business of this day. The invasion of our peaceful shores has terminated in the entire destruction of their army and the total loss of everything brought over. Still, we have much to sorrow for. In that desperate charge at dawn, a sniper had recognized General Brock's uniform. A Canadian volunteer in Brock's regiment saw the shot. One of them took deliberate aim and fired, and our gallant general fell within a few feet of where I stood. Are you much hurt, sir? I inquired. He placed his hand on his breast and made no reply, and slowly sunk down. Isaac Brock is buried at Fort George as the British cannon fire a 21-gun salute. Across the river, the Americans answer with their own salute. Brock will be remembered as the savior of Upper Canada, a place he didn't much care for and whose people he never trusted. But in that critical first year of the war, he bought the province time and gave it a reason to fight.
Tecumseh is recruiting warriors a thousand miles away when Brock falls at Queenston Heights. By now, the Shawnee chief is known to every tribe from the Canadian border to the Gulf of Mexico. The war has given him an opportunity to realize a vision. A unified and independent Indian Confederacy powerful enough to resist American expansion. A nation within a nation. The whites have driven us from the sea to the lakes. We can go no farther. Unless every tribe unanimously combines to give a check to the ambition and avarice of the whites, they will soon conquer us apart and disunited. And we will be driven from our native country and scattered as autumn leaves before the wind. To American leaders intent on expanding settlement, Tecumseh is a dangerous man. Indiana Governor William Henry Harrison both fears and admires him. The implicit obedience and respect which the followers of Tecumseh pay to him bespeaks him one of those uncommon geniuses which spring up occasionally to produce revolutions. Tecumseh has emerged as one of the most powerful Indian leaders on the continent. As the war enters its second year, he has demonstrated his courage and skill in half a dozen battles. But in September of 1813, Tecumseh can only listen to a faraway battle and wait. The sound of warships carries for 30 miles. The American and British fleets are in the midst of a battle that will change the course of the war. An Englishman had once sneered that the American Navy was nothing but a few frigates manned by a handful of bastards and outlaws. But today, they are good enough. When it is over, the Americans have command of Lake Erie. Tecumseh knows what will come next. His old enemy, William Henry Harrison, is waiting with an invasion force of 5,000 men. Tecumseh looks forward to the fight. But his allies have other ideas. Now that they have lost control of the lake, the British fear they can be cut off and trapped on the Detroit frontier. So they choose retreat. Fort Detroit, which Tecumseh and Brock had captured a year earlier, is abandoned. In a rage, Tecumseh confronts the British general, Henry Proctor, and accuses him of cowardice. We must compare our father's conduct to that of a fat dog that carries his tail on his back, but when frightened, he drops it between his legs and runs off. We wish to remain here and fight our enemy. You have got the arms and ammunition. If you intend to retreat, give them to us and you may go. Our lives are in the hands of the Great Spirit. We are determined to defend our lands, and if it be his will, we wish to leave our bones upon them. Proctor is unmoved. The British will pull back up the Thames River, all the way to York if necessary. It is an agonizingly slow retreat. For a week, Harrison's army chases them down, gaining every day. 
By the time General Proctor finally turns to make a stand at Moravian Town, the Redcoats and Tecumseh's warriors are exhausted and disheartened. Most have not eaten in more than two days. They have only a single cannon and not much ammunition, and they are outnumbered two to one. The Americans mount a cavalry charge. For the Redcoats and Private Shadrach Byfield, veteran of Detroit and Queenston Heights, the battle is over in less than 10 minutes. After exchanging a few shots, our men gave way. One of our sergeants exclaimed, For God's sake, men, stand and fight! I stood by him and fired one shot, but the line was broken and the men were retreating. I then made my escape into the wood. General Proctor fled for safety as soon as the fighting started. Leaving his men to be captured or killed. On the right flank, Tecumseh and a few hundred warriors, now hopelessly outnumbered, fight on for another hour. The sound of Tecumseh's voice, which all had heard urging on the fight, is gone. It is not certain who killed Tecumseh or what happened to his body. Some believe his warriors carried him from the field as they retreated. Others claim the body was left to American souvenir hunters who took his clothing and tore off strips of skin for razor straps. What is certain is that wherever he lies, there is nothing to mark the place. The great barrier was broken. It was my last fight. My heart was very big then. Tecumseh filled it. It has been empty ever since. Tecumseh's army has been broken. Never again will the military services of the Indians regain their importance in colonial affairs. Tecumseh's dream of a pan-Indian confederacy dies with him. In the fall of 1813, the Americans hold the western frontier of Upper Canada. But they now face the simple truth that no army can conquer Canada without taking Quebec. The Canadiens have always known that sooner or later they will come. It is an improbable army that digs in the defenses on the banks of the Chateau Gay River to face the invaders. French Canadians standing shoulder to shoulder with the British. Louis Guy and David Johnson. Michael O'Sullivan and Joseph-Marie Lantin. Daly and Brugier. They are led by Lieutenant Colonel Charles Michel de Salaberry, a man whose grandfather fought against the British and whose father fought for them. Now French and British will face a common enemy. The American strategy is a classic pincer move. One force will march north along the Chateauguay River, while a second comes down the St. Lawrence. When they meet, Montreal will fall. De Salaberry's Voltageur and the Canadian militia 
are chosen to make a stand on the banks of the Chateau Gay. Colonel de Salaberry selected a strong position, and we began to fortify ourselves with trees and to form entrenchments. Behind these works, we lay for three days and three nights, waiting for the enemy. In the coming battle, 24-year-old Charles Pengay of the Canadian Fencibles will be cited for bravery. He and Charles Michel de Salaberry know they will be vastly outnumbered. And if they fail, Lower Canada will be lost. On the morning of October the 26th, 1813, 4,000 Americans take to the field. They know they are facing only a few hundred Canadians in the forward lines. Legend has it, an American officer came forward to demand their surrender, and de Salaberry himself answered with a musket ball. What is certain is that when the Americans open fire, they think they have won the battle. Cheers ring out from their army, but when the smoke clears, Charles Pangay and the other Canadians have stood their ground. All of our men fired from 35 to 40 rounds, so well aimed that the prisoners told us the next day that every shot seemed to pass at the height of a man's breast or head. It is over in a few hours. believe the Americans have retreated only to mount another attack. And so, for eight more days, Pangay and the others lie behind their barricades in the cold and wet, and wait. We suffered so much from foul weather that some of our men fell sick every day. I now know that a man can endure without dying more pain and hell than a dog. There are many things that I could tell you more easily than I can write them, but you will be convinced by this affair that Canadians know how to fight. Charles Pangay dies a few months later. The Americans never do get to Montreal. A few weeks after the victory at Chateau Gay, the second half of the American invasion plan also crumbles. On November 11th, in the fields of John Chrysler's farm, a greatly outnumbered force of British regulars and Canadian militia drives the invaders back. For the second time in less than 40 years, the Americans have tried to conquer Lower Canada and failed. Now their focus shifts back to Upper Canada. And this time, the threat will come both from without and within. In the summer of 1814, a mass execution sends an unmistakable message to the population of Upper Canada. Eight men, convicted of treason for aiding the American forces, are hanged at Burlington Heights.
Since the beginning of the war, dozens of Upper Canadians have turned traitor. But the most notorious of them all is still at large. Joseph Wilcox has come a long way since serving his prison term for libel. At the outbreak of the war, he was re-elected to the Upper Canada Assembly and became leader of the unofficial opposition. But in the summer of 1813, Wilcox crosses the line from dissent to treason. He begins passing on military information to the American commanders. I now beg leave to lay before you some facts which most materially affect the plans proposed for the subjugation of this province. The enemy's force now at Burlington is certainly upwards of 1,200 regular troops, in addition to which there are at York 1,000 regulars. But I do not hesitate to say that so soon as the British are driven from amongst us, I shall with the assistance of my friends, render this province independent of British influence. Arch! Wilcox is still a member of the Assembly of Upper Canada when he becomes a colonel in the American Army. Within six weeks, he has raised a force of 130 Canadian volunteers to fight for the enemy. For a year, the Canadian turncoats wage a campaign of terror along the Niagara frontier. They even burn the village of Newark, whose people voted Wilcox into the assembly. Now, in the summer of 1814, Wilcox and his men commit a final act of treachery. They march with an American invasion force in one last push to capture Upper Canada. Amelia Ryers is just 16 when the invaders overrun her family's farm. When I looked up, I saw the hillside and the fields as far as the eye could reach, covered with American soldiers. My mother knew instinctively what they were going to do. She entreated the commanding officer to spare her property and said that she was a widow with a young family. He answered her civilly and respectfully and regretted that his orders were to burn. Very soon we saw a column of dark smoke arise from every building. And what at early morn had been a prosperous homestead. At noon there remained only smoldering ruins. The American invasion force doesn't get much farther than the Ryers' homestead. At a place called Lundy's Lane, within earshot of Niagara Falls, 3,500 British and Canadian troops are waiting for them. Here, among the grave markers of a pioneer cemetery, they will fight the bloodiest battle of the war. there is an informal ceasefire and both sides call in reinforcements. Canadian Henry Rutten waits in the British lines. It was yet so dark as to prevent distinguishing our men from those of the enemy. We could plainly see a line forming in our front and hear every order given. Now, 5,000 men face each other in the cemetery, in some places less than 100 feet apart. Fire! 
One militiaman describes the showers of musket balls like a sweeping hailstorm. In the confusion, it is impossible to tell friend from foe, and both sides kill their own men by mistake. darkness, the two armies clash, as one soldier recalled, with a desperation bordering on madness. Around midnight, fearing the battle is lost, the Canadian turncoats retreat. Joseph Wilcox escapes, but dies in battle six weeks later. On the next morning, the British and Canadians are left holding the field. Both armies have suffered terrible casualties. Oh, that the King and the President were both here this moment to see the injury their quarrels lead to. They would surely never go to war without a cause that they could give as a reason to God at the last day, for thus destroying the creatures that he hath made in his own image. A soldier's wife. The Canadian units are among the hardest hit. In one regiment, one of every three Canadians who fought at Lundy's Lane was killed or wounded. Canada's defenders pay a terrible price, but they have turned back the last major American invasion. The peace treaty will not be signed until Christmas Day, 1814, but Canada will never again be attacked. When the last Canadian veterans of the war gathered for a photograph in 1861, Canada was on the verge of nationhood. Old men now, they had fought and watched comrades die to secure and define the borders of that nation. The war that was supposed to assimilate the people of Canada has achieved precisely the opposite. In its determination not to become American, Canada has drawn closer to Britain than ever and has seen a glimmer of its own identity.